first one comes from Psalms 45, um, 13b to 21. The Lord is faithful to all his promises and loving towards all he has made. The Lord upholds all those who fall and lifts up all those, those who bow down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them the food of their proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and loving towards all he has made. The Lord is near to all those who call on him and to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him and hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. The second reading comes from Proverbs 31, 25 to 31. She is clothed with strength and dignity. And she can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceiving, beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the reward she has earned and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. This ends today's reading. Okay, we have a special presentation today and we are so pleased to have with us Luann Baker and she, um, her presentation is Ruth, Dedication and Obedience. Greetings, my name is Ruth, and I am from the land of Moab. Now in Moab, people bowed down and worshipped handmade, empty idols. That's the only way I knew how to worship, until one day, a very special family moved into our neighborhood. Now this family was from Bethlehem, the house of bread. Now, you're probably wondering why a Jewish family from Bethlehem would move to a land like Moab that worshipped idols. Well, you see, Bethlehem was experiencing a great famine. And this family made the very difficult decision to make the move to Moab, hoping that they would have a better life and more food for their family. Now, this family was made up of Elimelech, the father, Naomi, the mother, and the two sons, Malon and Kilion. Now, when a new family moves in to your neighborhood, what is the first thing you tend to do? Tell me. Welcome them. Welcome them. Take them food. Take them food. Take food. Okay. Now, come on, if we're honest, do you know what we do? <laughs> we watch them. We watch them, don't we? Sure we do. We watch them to see what kind of a family they are. Are they a clean and neat family? Or are they a messy family? Do the husband and wife respect each other and treat each other well? Or are they always bickering? Do the children obey and respect their parents? Or are they always rebelling? We watch them, don't we? Well, my friend Orpah and I, we watched this Jewish family. And we saw that they were a very, very happy, clean and neat family. A family bonded by love. But the thing that we really noticed was how they worshipped. You see, they didn't bow down and worship empty, handmade idols. No. Instead, do you know what they 
did. They would raise their hands into the heavens and they would dance and they would sing and they had smiles on their faces. Like they enjoyed what they were doing. It was like their worship came from the inside out. Well, Orca and I had watched enough of this family and we decided we were going to invite them and welcome them into the community. So we went out and we picked some wildflowers and we went to the front door, we knocked, and the lady of the house answered the door, Naomi. Oh, she just welcomed us in with open arms. She set us down some, with some goat cheese and goat milk and pita bread and she just made us feel right at home. She was the most gracious, kind, loving woman you would ever want to meet. Well, when we left that day, she told us, please come back. So we did. You know, it didn't hurt any that she had two sons about our age. Well, when we would go back to visit, Naomi would teach us how to cook and bake and present Jewish food. Now, I will have to admit that at first, I didn't quite care for the taste of kosher food, but as time went on, I got to really enjoy Jewish food. Well, as she was teaching us how to cook and bake and present Jewish food, she was also teaching us about God Almighty, why they worshipped the way they did, and who he was. Well, we visited Naomi's home a lot, and we got to know Malon and Kilion quite well. In fact, I married Malon and Orpa married Kilion, and we were one big happy family, and life was good in Moab. Until one day, sorrow struck our home. Because you see, Elimelech died. And when he died, a part of Naomi died with him. She became very dis distant and depressed. And no matter what the four of us tried to do to help, nothing worked. Well, it wasn't long after that that tragedy struck our home. Because you see, both Malon and Kilion died, leaving Orpah and I childless widows. We were grieving ourselves, but poor Naomi. She had lost her husband and her sons, and there she was in a foreign country, and now she had two Moabite girls to take care of. She became even more despondent and depressed. The sweet, loving, gracious Naomi that we once knew didn't exist any longer. It was very difficult for three widowed women to be living alone without a man protecting and providing for them. Ten years we lived like that until one day a visitor came to town, and he told us that Bethlehem was flourishing again, and Naomi wanted to go home. And so we all packed what little we had left, and we started off toward Bethlehem. And we weren't very long on the road when Naomi stopped, and she turned to us, and she said, Go back, girls. Go back to Moab. Go back to your families and be happy. Don't come with me. And we said, no, we don't want to go back. We belong with you. You're our mother now. You're our family now. She said, no, no, go back. Go back. Find husbands. Have babies. Don't, don't go with me. Be happy. She said, look at me. I'm old. I can't have babies anymore. And even if I did, and I had boy babies, would you wait for them to grow up and marry and have children? No. Go back to Moab. Go back and be happy. Well, Orpah, she was just sobbing. And she ran over to Naomi and she threw 
her arms around her and she kissed her and she hugged her. And she started back to Moab. But I knew that I couldn't go back to Moab. There was something pulling at my heartstrings. I knew I had to go to Bethlehem. And I looked at Naomi and I said, Naomi, I'm going with you. Wherever you go, that's where I will go. Wherever you lodge, that's where I will lodge. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. And wherever you're buried, that's where I, my bones will be buried also. Naomi, I'm not going back to Moab. I'm going to Bethlehem with you. And she just looked at me and turned and continued walking on. And I followed her. It was a very difficult journey and a dangerous journey to Bethlehem for two widows to be traveling alone. You know, there was lots of robbers on the way, but God delivered us. He delivered us to Bethlehem. The worst part of the journey was traveling with Naomi. You see, she wasn't very pleasant to be around in those days. Well, we finally made it to Bethlehem. And before entering the town, Naomi stopped and just stared. And I knew what she was thinking. She was thinking the same thing I was thinking. Would they even ever allow her to come into town, <coughs> being that she's bringing a Moab girl with her? And I was thinking, I wonder how long they'll even allow me to stay. Well, she started to walk on and I followed. And little groups of people started to gather on either side of the road. And you could hear them whispering, Who is that lady? Do you know that lady? Do you know? Who is that? And why the Moab girl? Why, why is she bringing the Moab girl? Who is she? You know, she, she kind of looks familiar, but I just can't place her. Wait. No. No. That can't be. That, that can't be Naomi, could it? I mean, it's been ten years, but, oh, she looks so hard and tired and worn. And, and if that's Naomi, where's Elimelech? Where's Malon and Kilion? And why? Why would she have a Moabite girl with her? Well, they found out, yes, it was Naomi, when we moved into Naomi's old home. We were busy putting things away when another knock came to our door. I opened the door, and some of the town women just flooded in, ran over to Naomi, and threw their arms around her, and they said, oh, Naomi, we're so glad you're home. We missed you, Naomi. Oh, we love you, Naomi. And I could tell that at one time, she was a very highly respected and loved woman in that town. She probably taught some of those women how to cook and bake and present Jewish food. She probably taught them why and how to praise and worship God Almighty. And they were just loving on her. And all of a sudden, Naomi turned to them and she said, Don't call me Naomi any longer. You can call me Mark. Because Mara means bitterness, and that's just how God has treated my life with much bitterness. I felt so bad for those ladies. They were just welcoming her in and smiling, but the smiles left. And their shoulders drooped and their heads hung as they walked out of the house. Well, we finished putting everything away. And I knew that I had to do something to bring in some food for us to eat. And I remembered that as we came into Bethlehem, that the barley harvest was in full swing. And I thought if I could just get in a barley field and glean, at least we would have a little bit to eat. So I went to Naomi and I asked permission to do that. And she looked at me and she said, yes, my daughter. Oh. 
when she called me her daughter. My heart just warmed because I knew that sweet, loving, gracious Naomi was still in that body. But she said, when you go to clean, you stay with the women and you work hard and mind your own business. Now, let me explain to you what gleaning is. Gleaning is for the poorest of the poor. And it's a very back-breaking job. Because when you go in and you glean, you follow the reapers, and you're bent over all day long, and you either have a, an apron or a basket, and you're bowing down and you're picking up little bits of leftover barley, put in your basket. And after a full day's work, after you go to the threshing floor and you pound your barley out, you may have a little cup of barley, but at least it was something to eat. Now, women in the gleaning fields, it's very dangerous for them to be there. They're usually abused, raped, or sometimes killed. And me, being a Moabite girl, I was in even more danger. Well, the next morning I got up, and I took a basket, and I walked down the road, and I went into the first barley field I came to. And I joined in with the women, and I started to glean. And as I was gleaning, I could hear the workers talk about this Boaz and how much they respected him and liked him. And eventually I thought, this must be the owner of the field. And this is very unusual because usually owners and workers don't like each other. But they did. Well, the one afternoon as I was gleaning, a very handsome man riding a beautiful horse came into the field. And all the workers stopped everything they were doing, and they ran, and they said, Oh, welcome, Master, welcome, blessings on you. And he, in return, was smiling and saying, and Blessings on you, too. And I could see that it was very genuine. They liked each other. They respected each other. And I thought, this Boaz must be a special man. Well, he dismounted his horse, and I saw that he took the foreman of the workers over to the corner of the field. Well, I just kept my head down and I kept gleaning. And at one time I did glance up and there they were pointing at me. And I thought, oh, they're deciding when to put me out of the field. So I thought, I'll just glean as much as I can glean until they throw me out. Well, the next thing I knew, there was a man standing beside me. And he said, woman. And I said, yes, my Lord. He said, woman, my foreman had told me what a good worker you are. You work from sun up to sundown, and you take very few water breaks, and you do not chase the men. I don't want you to go into any other fields but mine. And I have instructed my workers to drop sheaves of barley for you to pick up. And they are not to lay a hand on you. And they are not to make fun of you either. And I said, oh my Lord, why have I found such grace in your eyes? And he said, because my workers also told me that you, you are a widow. And you came from your native land with your widowed mother-in-law to help take care of her. That is a noble woman. And I said, oh my Lord, may I continue to find grace in your eyes. And he laughed. Well, I finished gleaning that day and I was on my way to the threshing floor to pound out my barley. And I looked and there was Boaz coming across the field. And he said, Ruth, hey Ruth, come on over, eat supper with us. I just froze, and I thought, did he really say my name? Well, he walked a little closer, 
children, he said, Ruth, Ruth, come on over. Eat supper with us. He did say my name. So very cautiously, I walked over and into the camp. And those people were so gracious, they slid apart and made me a seat right on the log around the fire. They began passing food, fresh, roasted, good barley. And it was so good. And then they started to pass the bread and the wine vinegar to dip the bread in. They just kept passing the food and passing the food. I couldn't eat it all. And they said, that's OK. We'll just put it in a sack, and you can take it home for your mother-in-law. So she'll have food. Well, whenever I was done that night, I thanked everybody. And I got up and I left. And I could hardly wait to get home to tell Naomi all about it. Well, when I did, I, and then when I showed her the food, oh my goodness, it was just so much food. And she said, Boaz, oh, Boaz. He is one of our kinsmen redeemers. And I said, well, what's a kinsman redeemer? And she said, well, he's akin to us. And when the head of a clan dies, then that estate is up to be taken over by another kinsman. And then all the people in that clan are taken care of by him for the rest of their life, thus being the redeemer. So he is one of our kinsmen Redeemers. She said, you make sure you stay in good eyes and good standing with Boaz for the rest of the weeks of the barley season. That's just what I did. And one night, I came home, and she said, we need to find you a new home. And I said, I don't want a new home. I, I live with you. You and I are family. She said, no, no, no. We're going to find you a new home. Tomorrow night when you come home, I want you to take a bath. A bath was something very special in those days because you only took a bath once every you know, two, three months. She said, I want you to take a bath. I want you to put on lots of perfume. And I want you to wear your pretty dress and fix your hair and take that beautiful shawl you have and wrap it around your shoulders. And I want you to go over to where Boaz and his men are camped. Wait until they have had the fill of food and drink and are sleeping. Then I want you to go over and I want you to go where Boaz is. Turn back the cover from his feet and lay down at his feet, and Boaz will tell you what to do from there. I thought, why would I want to do something like that? I have just gained the respect of Boaz, and you're asking me to do something like this? And then I thought, no, no. Naomi knows the customs. I don't. And Naomi would never ever do anything to bring harm to me. So I need to obey Naomi. So the next night, I came home, and I took a bath. Oh, it felt so good. And then I put on lots of perfume. I put on my pretty dress, I fixed my hair, and I threw that beautiful shawl around my shoulder. And I went over to where Boaz and his men were camped. And I waited in the shadows until they had had their fill of food and drink and were sleeping. And I very, very quietly and cautiously made my way through that camp to where Boaz was. I bent down and I very softly turned the covers back from his feet and I curled up around his feet. During the night, something must have startled Boaz because he said, Who's there? Who's there? My heart began to pound. And my voice was shaken and I said, Oh, my Lord. Oh, my Lord, it's me, Ruth. Your servant. And he said, Ah, oh, Ruth. 
lay back down and cover yourselves over with, with my covers and sleep the night. But when you leave tomorrow morning, don't let anybody know that you have been here. And Boaz laid his head back down, just went to sleep like that. Needless to say, I didn't get much sleep that night. <laughs> I waited and waited and waited, and finally the sun began to come up. And I turned back the covers from over me, and I was just about ready to get up when I heard, Ruth, hand me your shawl. And I thought, I can't hand him my shawl. If I hand him my shawl, then people will know that I was here. And he told me not to tell anybody that I was here. And he said, Ruth, Hand me your shawl. So I took the shawl from my shoulders and I handed it to him. Do you know what he did? He filled that beautiful shawl with almost a half bushel of good barley. Do you know how much that was worth? That was worth a lot of money. And he handed me it and he said, here, take this back to Naomi and tell her that I am going to go and meet with the other kinsman redeemer that stands in line before me. If he decides to take over the estate, then I will have to step aside. But if he doesn't, then I will become your kinsman redeemer. Well, I took the sack of barley and I made my way through the camp without trying to wake anybody up. And I ran home and I told Naomi everything about it and she said, you can be sure that Boaz will have an answer for us before the evening is over. And there we sat and we waited. And we waited and we waited. Have you ever had to wait for a very, very important decision? It just seems like time stands still. Well, that's where Naomi and I were. We were just sitting and waiting. In the meantime, Boaz got up, went into town, and got himself ten elders as witnesses. And he took them with him over to the other kinsman's camp. Well, he sat down with him, and he proceeded to tell him that Elimelech and the family went to Moab during the great famine. And while there, Elimelech and the two sons died. And now Naomi is back, and the estate is up for him to take over if he wants it. And the other kinsman said, oh, yes, yes, I want that clan. Yes, I do. I will become the estate owner. And then, and then Boaz said, while they were in Moab, the oldest son married a Moabite girl. Her name is Ruth. And this Moabite girl, Ruth, goes along with the estate to carry on the name of Elimelech. And that kinsman said, no, 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 no. I don't want that estate. I would never, never dirty my clan with a Moabite. Never, no. And Boaz stood up and said, then I will become their kinsman, redeemer. Now, to finalize a transaction in those days, one of the men would take off their sandal and hand it to the other one. And Boaz said to the witnesses, stand. And they stood and they said, you are my witnesses today that I have become the kinsman redeemer of the clan of Elimelech. And this woman, Ruth, the Moabitess, goes along with the clan. The witnesses were standing and they said, We are witnesses today that you have become the kinsman redeemer of the clan of Elimelech. And this woman, Ruth, we tell you that she will be a blessing unto Israel, just the way Rachel and Leah were a blessing unto Israel. That day, Boaz came back and gave us the news. 
It wasn't long after that that Boaz took me, a lowly Moabite girl, as his wife. Ladies and gentlemen, I wasn't always dressed this way. We were so happy together. And we brought Naomi in and had her live with us. And we were such a happy family. And life was good in Bethlehem. And it became even better. One year later, when I gave birth to our first child, it was a boy. And when the midwives took that baby boy and wrapped him and put him in Naomi's arms, I could see tears running down her cheeks. And I could see the glistening coming back in her eyes. And a smile returned to her face. Naomi became that sweet, gracious, loving Naomi again. We named our son Obed. Obed became the father of Jesse. And Jesse became the father of who? David. David. And David was in the lineage of none other than Jesus Christ, the final kinsman, redeemer. The redeemer that gave up his lofty home in heaven to come down to earth to be born as a poor, humble child. Jesus, the one who they ridiculed and beat within an inch of his life. Jesus, who willingly laid himself down on that ugly, cruel cross and allowed them to pound nails into his hands and his feet. Jesus, the one who hung on that cross and died and shed that perfect, precious, Priceless blood for you and for me. That blood that redeems us from our sins. And all we have to do is come to him and ask for forgiveness. And that blood washes us clean. And you may say, oh, but you don't know. You don't know who I am. You don't know what I've done and what I've been. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. That's why he died on that cross. He wants to cleanse you with that precious, priceless blood. Don't wait another day. This is a perfect day to give your life to Jesus. And some of you are saying, but you don't know what situation I'm in. God will make a way for you. He made a way for me, a lowly Moabite girl that used to worship empty idols. And he will make a way for you too. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be your guide. Hold you closely by your side. With love and strength for each new day. He will make a way. God will make a way. Shalom. Thank you for letting us share our worship service with you today. We invite you to join us in person next Sunday at 1030, or if you prefer, to listen online Sunday afternoon. If you would like to make a donation, please visit our website at www.marionpress.org and click the Donate Now button. May God bless you and have a great week.